we offer people courses that get them jobs. Um, we teach modern technical skills. Uh, and in fact, uh, we try to innovate not just in terms of teaching, but on the model of education itself. So one of the things we, that's the, of the many things that uh, distinguish Flatiron School, one of them is that if you follow all of our career services guidelines and all of our terms, and you don't get a job after six months, we'll give you a full refund. So we're, you know, uh, it, it, it's a pretty good product. It works. Wow. <laughs> and you're very well known. I mean, you guys somehow became leaders in teaching coding, known leaders. How did you engineer that? So uh, when uh, I've been in programs since I was 11, the internet came out when I was growing up. I thought it was going to be a big deal. Started teaching myself how to code. And uh, I left my first startup around seven and a half years ago. And I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I started teaching these programming classes and mentoring my best students and getting them jobs. And people started writing articles about this kid in a conference room, teaching people how to code and getting them jobs. And it kind of occurred to me that there's really only two ways to become a programmer. You could do what I did, bang your head against a wall for 10 years and teach yourself, or you can get a CS degree. And that really disenfranchises a large pile of part of the population. CS um, meaning? Computer science. OK, right, right. And Sorry. I wanted to create another path for people to be able to get the kinds of skills that it meant so much for me um, without necessarily having to go to a four-year college and spend all that money. So you uh, run Flatiron School as a six-month school, did you say? Uh, our programs range from on campus for three to four months full time all day every day to online up to 18 months. Which is the most popular product of those? They're about the same size. So yeah. we have eight campuses around the world now and we're growing. Online we have students in over 30 countries. So most students are in for six months, you said? Uh, our on-campus programs are three to four months. Three to four. Our online programs allow people to take the, take the course part-time if they're working, and so that'll take a little longer. Um, what is the difference between teaching digital native students and digital immigrants, people say 40 or older? Good question. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, so first of all, when you talk about digital native, I think that's actually a little bit of a, um, a misnomer, right? So for example, most people think kids are great with technology, yeah. right? People think, oh yeah, they have iPads and they have all this stuff. They're great with technology. They're so much better than adults. It's actually not true because what's happened, when Avi taught himself how to code, the way he did it was by playing a game and then realizing, ah, this isn't hard enough. I'm going to go into the source code of the game and tinker with it and make it harder. Kids today have access to things like iPads and iPhones that are actually so pristine that you can't break it. You can't, you can't tear it apart and open it up and see what's in the guts and fiddle with it. And so even though kids have access to more technology than ever, they actually have fewer learning opportunities than, for example, I had when I had to go and buy parts for my computer because it was overheating. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of like the car mechanics. They used to get under the hood and fix it. That's right. Now they've got to look at a piece of software and that, replace the bad part. That's right. So you know what really makes people successful in this field, and again, Avi has this great uh, phrase. He, 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 like, you like to say that um, people think you have to be born in the matrix to be a, be a software engineer. And it's entirely untrue. The, the, the core of what makes somebody really successful here, um, and it's in all the courses we teach, whether it's programming, data science, design, it's creativity. It's the ability to take these relatively basic tools, technology that anybody can learn, and apply it in a creative way that's going to solve a meaningful problem for somebody. How do you find teachers who are as enthusiastic and as engaging and excited about it as you to make it interesting? Or do we leave interesting outside the door and just do digits? So no, I mean, Abby can talk more to this. but techno uh, We believe, and I think one of, you, know, you started by asking us what's made us successful. The single most important thing in education is teachers. You can throw everything else out the door. If you have an amazing teacher, they can do anything. And without a great teacher, you cannot be successful. And so it's one of the most important things we focus on is finding <coughs> great teachers and cultivating them, providing them with additional training. We invest a lot in that. Um, but we also have to allow each teacher to uh, teach according to their own styles and strengths. And, and we started with Avi, who was teaching. And, and yeah, it's actually interesting. You said, uh, you know, do you focus on making it interesting or just you know, the facts? And I didn't think I was a great teacher at first. So I figured the best thing I could do is get my students to love programming as much as I do, because once they loved it, they would want to be really great at it. 
Um, so we really invest a lot in making sure that the pedagogy of the school is inspirational, that as Adam said, it's creative, it's interesting, because we want students not just to be able to learn this, but to really have a passion for it so that they can have not just a job, but a prolific career. Do you hire the teachers full-time, part-time, or both, or what? All our teachers are full-time. We invest a lot in teacher training. They go through the course. We, we really want them to understand what our culture is, how we've structured the curriculum so that they can instill the same sort of enthusiasm for this craft as you know we had in the originally. Who are your teachers? How do you find these dream employees? What did they do before they came with you? So it's really hard because you know the reason we exist, if you kind of take a step back and think about it, we started six years ago with a school that charges now, charges upwards of $15,000 for this intensive course. And after three to four months, gets you a full-time job as a, as a software engineer where the average salary for people who accept full-time jobs is over $75,000 a year. Colleges, after four years, can't do this. How is it possible that we exist? And part of it is that we're just actually focused on teaching relevant skills. But the other part of it is that these skills are incredibly in high demand. Right? There are way more jobs than there are people. And so what that means is that in order to find people that know this technology, it's really hard. So finding people that know it and want to teach it and are good teachers is even harder. It's incredibly difficult to find great teachers. So we have a huge focus on it. Um, we also, I mean, one thing that helps is we have to, we, we pay them well. I think teachers in America are not paid a fraction of what they should be. Um, we compensate our teachers the, uh, uh, what we hope that they sh would be able to make in a regular software engineering job if they chose to do that. Um, but uh, we, we look for people that are really incredibly passionate about uh, sharing uh, these skills with people. And so typically, all of our lead instructors both have experience in the field that they're teaching, whether it's in the field as a software engineer, in the field as a data scientist, um, and experience teaching, whether that's in a classroom, or speaking at conferences, or writing books. Um, so we look for both of those things. And it's a very, very, very hard thing to find. And I, I would say that that's our single biggest um, barrier to, to growth, is that we will not you know, have a class without a great teacher, because we know that that's ultimately what makes students successful. So this is fascinating that I didn't think of that. Your teachers all have their choice of jobs. Oh, yeah. They're, so how do you get them, I mean, with decent pay, but how do you say, would, would you say, come talk to us, at least meet with us? So, I yeah. think, how do you we, close them? There's, there's a lot of things we do. I mean, one thing that we offer all of our teachers is actually a rotation in our engineering uh, part of the company. So we develop a lot of educational software. So we allow our teachers to teach for a year and then join the engineering team and go back to being a software developer. That gives them uh, some flexibility in both what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but also keeps their skills relevant. They like that. They I love that, right? We, yeah. we also we get to punch above our weight class in terms of talent um, because of what we do for communities. So, for example, starting you know back in 2013, 2014, we started programs called uh, fellowship programs that gave free tuition to people who, who came from low-income backgrounds. Even today, we have a, a school in Brooklyn called Access Labs, where the entire school is only open to people who make under $35,000 a year, and they don't pay any tuition until after they graduate. Um, and in fact, today, I think our fourth uh, person out of that school accepted a job at Amazon making in excess of $90,000 a year. Um, and so people come to us because we do these things and they may, you know, we maybe we could make more money focusing on um, just charging people tuition up front or, char or working with easier populations. But I think one of the things that's special about Flatiron School is that we figured out how to do well as a business by doing good. Yeah, being and, so. And we would not be able to recruit the people that work at Flatiron School if we weren't so focused on things like economic mobility and diversity in tech. And so by doing those things for the community, it helps us to recruit great people, which then helps the business. This school you have in Brooklyn is free for someone who's under 30 so in if income, you make, right? If you make under $35,000 a Family. year when you apply, um, you don't have to pay tuition until after you get a job. So in a way, you are doing what the critics want Amazon to do when it gets here, and they've only said, we'll give you the land for a school. You're already out doing Amazon. Well, I, so uh, congratulations. <laughs> that's that, I mean, that's incredible. I don't know. What, we're, what we're excited about is creating uh, a talent pipeline in New York City. We want to make sure that 
tech jobs go to New Yorkers that are coming from diverse backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds. And by creating these kinds of programs like Access Labs, where students don't have to take on so much risk and only get paid once they only pay us once they get a job, uh, we're really excited to provide the employment force that companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft are going to need as they continue to expand to New yeah, York. And, and look, to be honest, you know, that program that I talked about, Amazon has already hired people from that program, both in New York and in Virginia. And so it's, you know, yet to be seen how uh, Amazon treats members of the community. But I think these are promising signs. And hopefully, as they come and, and start to build their HQ2 in both of these states, if they kind of continue down this path, I think that's a really good sign, right? They are currently hiring people from Flatiron School that come from low-income backgrounds to work in at Amazon at these really high salaries. How big is Amazon going to be for Queens and New York? I think as in as much as they put a focus on investing in the local community and in uh, creating economic opportunity for that local community, I think it could be amazing for the community and amazing for Amazon. And if they don't, it of course will hurt the community, but I think it'll hurt Amazon even more. So um, I'm optimistic that it could be a really, really great thing uh, in as much as they, they uh, maintain that focus. If they keep a foot on the local ground. Absolutely. No helicopter pads, <laughs> so to speak. And sure. So it's up to them, right? Because they'll be welcomed if they're nice. I think it's a collaboration between New York City and Amazon to make sure that they are investing in the community, whether through education, through job mobility, um, through all sorts of ways that they can make sure that by coming to New York and growing in New York, it's good for everybody. You uh, guys have eight, eight cities around the world now. You have Flatiron so schools. What is the answer for business owners about scaling? I, I can't imagine how you get the eight around the world, but what's the key to scaling your business, whatever it is? I think the key to any business, in my opinion, is that if you provide a lot of value to people, you earn the right to capture a little bit of that value for yourself as a business. And so in as much as we kind of stick to our really high bar for quality, we can continue to grow you know, for a very, very, very long time, and any business can, right? I think businesses struggle when, as they grow, the quality starts to deteriorate. They're not offering as much value to customers, and so customers aren't as willing to share value with them, to pay them or to, to be customers. And so, um, and that's very hard in education in particular. So what we've done is try to put in infrastructure to make sure that there's absolutely no way we can grow without staying true to great outcomes for our students. And we've done that in two ways. One is accountability, I, like I already mentioned. If you adhere to all of our guidelines and you don't get a job in six months, you get a full refund. If all of education had that, I think we'd be avoiding a lot of problems in America. And the second one is transparency. We have a third party CPA uh, validate and certify all of our job outcomes. So you can go to our website and download a report that's validated by a CPA that says here's how many people graduated from the program of everyone that enrolled, here's how many got jobs, here, here are the average salaries, here are what industries they got jobs in. And so as we grow, we, we're committed to being fully transparent and fully accountable to our students. And that means that if quality starts to deteriorate, deteriorate our business won't be successful. And I, you know, I think if all of education adopted those two things, transparency and accountability, we'd be in a lot better place in America. Before we started, I asked in passing of uh, both of you if you're both native New Yorkers. And you responded to me and told me something about your backgrounds that I think explains a lot of your success today. You are both native New Yorkers? We're both born in New York. Uh, both of our parents are immigrants. My dad is from Argentina. My mom is from Morocco. And uh, you know, coming to America as immigrants, I think they saw education as really the silver bullet, as the single best thing they could do for us was to make sure that they invested in our education, um, which I think gave Adam and I a real respect for what education can do for people. I wondered before we met how Flatiron School became so popular and so well known. I completely understand. <laughs> it's you too. Uh, Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Avi, good luck. Thank you very much.